without further ado, I'll let Richard take us off to the beginnings of our journey. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Kenneth Lambert was, was certainly in me, and I remember my delight when shortly after the beginning of my analysis with him, he answered a question which was looking for a rather fancier answer by telling me that he supposed that the aim of analysis to, was to become more like yourself. What I want in this paper is to present some material which demonstrates the patient becoming more like herself, and more specifically how she uses images derived from her parents in order to make this self available. And this will illustrate two theoretical ideas which I intend to describe beforehand. These are, first of all, that assembling the idea of a parental intercourse is vital to the assembly of the self, and that on this achievement hinges to a large extent the ability to function mentally in various crucially adaptive ways. Secondly, that whereas there is a term for the destructive drive towards the parent's intercourse, there is, as far as I'm aware, no name to attach to this urge to assemble the, parent, the parental intercourse. I'm suggesting that the figure of Telemachus in Homer's Odyssey may be used to represent this positive drive to get the parents together, and this, that this may distinguish it from the divisive drive, more commonly, though arguably, to some extent, ascribed to Sophocles' Oedipus. So first, this assembling the parental intercourse and assembling the self. There are many ways in which recent developments in psychoanalysis have converged with those of analytical psychology, but one feature of Jung's psychology that continues to distinguish it from psychoanalysis is, philosophically speaking, Jung's idealism, as opposed to Freud's empiricist standpoint. Jung saw mental operations, including the capacity for fantasy, as arising innately from the operations of the central nervous system, whereas psychoanalysts tend to think of these fantasies, I have to be careful with John sitting here, <laughs> as fantasies about external objects empirically received, even where they subscribe to the notion of innate unconscious fantasy. Jung's idea of fantasy is that the capacity for fantasy is closed by the objects in the environment which are available to personify or realize it. This implies that as one realizes one's fantasy life in relation to primitive objects available in the environment, it is the innate structures of one's own self that are being realized, and to this extent, one's own self that one is becoming. Even though this implies object relatedness, this is in contrast to the concept of self which is, a, which is created ex nihilo out of objects taken in or interjected. A central fantasy or <clears throat> set of fantasies in each individual is usually subsumed under the titles of the primal scene and the Oedipus complex. One of the ostensible reasons for the split between Freud and Jung was the latter's idealist view of the Oedipus complex which saw the issue of incest symbolically. More recently, many psychoanalysts have elaborated a similar view, of course. Originally, Freud's concept of the Oedipus complex was centered on the development of the child's genital wishes towards a conscious axial parent, which resulted in fears of castration by the rival parent of the same sex. This development was considered to be relatively late, around about the age of four or five. <coughs> Fantasies arising from this complex were coloured by, but nonetheless separate from, the issues subsumed under the idea of the primal scene, which were fantasies elaborated in various modes, oral, anal, or genital, about the parents' intercourse, which may or may not have been witnessed in fact. Klein and her followers pushed the date at which Oedipal fantasies were thought to take place much earlier, before the child had consolidated the idea of the whole person. Klein observed and elucidated a rich and complicated set of fantasies around the child's idea of the penis within the breast in both boys and girls. Both breast and penis, as well as the children they are fantasied to engender, are seen as reassuring, as threatening, as sustaining, as sources of pleasure, as mutually vital, as mutually destructive, and so on. These ideas gave rise to the concept of the combined object, which has been developed at great length by Meltzer, 
combined object is, is the composite made up variably of nipple and mouth, nipple and breast, breast and penis, and so on, developing continually into the idea of a creative intercourse between whole parents. Meltzer's idea now is that the infant starts with a sense of a combined object as an idealized and aesthetic experience which is both unbearable in its beauty and provocative of envy. And that what we see in subsequent fantasy productions is what he calls the debris of the original composite, which the child has attempted to dismantle in the face of his aesthetic pain and envy. It's important to notice that whether or not the composite is attacked and dismantled in fantasy, it has also been put together in fantasy. The fact of destruction implies prior construction, and it is sometimes difficult to be certain as to whether one is looking at the fragments of, a, of debris, which are the results of a dismantling, or at the building blocks of a new construction. This idea of construction is the exact opposite of Freud's original conception of the Oedipus complex as a divisive fantasy, though not perhaps of Sophocles' tragedy. Before returning to this implied activity of constructing a parental intercourse or marriage, it's worth considering the adaptive function, Jung would have said, theological, of this fantasy. I've already considered this at some length in previous papers, and so will merely summarize their findings here. In those papers, I had used clinical evidence to suggest the notion that, as Jung suggested in his Psychology of the Transference, the parental couple <clears throat> and fantasy about it was used to personify the child himself at various stages of development and in various dynamic states. Many writers postulate an initial stage of development in which the infant is in a state of readiness for or innately predisposed to an experience which has not yet been predicated by that experience. A grammatical metaphor would be that successive experience as experiences of appropriate predicates predicate the subject and allow the establishment of, an, of identity. Michael Fordham, in particular, has formulated the idea of the deintegrate mating with its realization along these lines. Beyond talks of the appropriate experience the predicate containing the preconception or deintegrate, thus making sense of it. The evidence I produced previously suggested that this experience of the self could be symbolized as an intercourse between a penetrating penis representing the preconception, uh, and a receptive mm. breast or mother representing the contained realization. To the extent that turbulence of deintegration and of dawning awareness are experienced as painful, this intercourse may be fantasied as sadistic or painful in itself. Identifying containing awareness and developing mind with mother therefore results in her being seen as damaged because she like the original integrate, is no longer felt to be pristine and self-contained. At this point, the individual's capacity for renewal, repair, and recovery can be symbolized by the fantasy of an intercourse between the breast and the reparative penis, which is now fantasy to replenish the breast supply of milk, to clean it up, to give it babies, thus, thus ensuring its creativity. Permitting the parents to couple in his fantasy because of the inducements of re repairing what is persecutingly damaged forces upon the child the issue both of the nature of his or her genital and of its immaturity, so that he is forced to relinquish the fantasy of omnipotent control over his parents' intercourse. Because this intercourse represents his own capacity for creative thought, that is for different, different processes in himself coming together in creative intercourse, as well as his deintegrative and reintegrative re capacity. The individual relinquishes control over these as well within himself and learns to wait for maturational processes. Correspondingly, denial of the fantasy intercourse attacks upon it and upon any faculties that might register an intercourse, resulting in spectacular loss of identity and of the sense of self. They also result in a serious disturbance in the capacity to think, allowing one idea to mate with another, and in creativity, 
spurious solutions and satisfactions rob the subject not only of real satisfactions and solutions, but also of creative faculties that might evaluate them. It's tempting, therefore, tempting to have a drink at this point, actually. <laughs> It's my privilege, not yours. It's tempting, therefore, to postulate that these fantasies, which tend to be subsumed under the concepts of the Oedipus complex and the primal scene, are in part fantasies whereby the self at various stages of development can be represented. In particular, this is a thinking, problem-solving, creative and critical self. Its capacities for these functions is incarnated as an algebra whose symbols, functions and variables are provided by the parents or by parts of them by the child's own libidinal zones and instincts. Where the objects <coughs> provided by the parents fall, fail, or the child's own constitutional endowment is overwhelmingly problematic, there's frequently evidence, even in psychosis, of attempts to furnish symbolic restitution. The debris may in fact constitute the ingredients of a synthetic initiative rather than, or as well as, the results of a vicious attack. In analysis, the transference is used to embody, supplement, or modify what has been distorted, lacking, or intolerable by way of environmental provision. But, but the aim of analysis remains the realization of the patient's own self in a way that was frustrating in previous development. In Kenneth Lambert's words, it is to allow the patient to become more like himself. This is importantly different to the aims of analysis as stated by Roger Mani Curl, a Kleinian psychoanalyst. He stated, the aim of analysis has been to help the patient, quote, understand what he, is already, what he already innately knows, in particular, the recognition of the breast as, as a supremely good object, and recognition of the parent's intercourse as a supremely creative act, and the recognition of the inevitability of time and ultimately death. The recognition of time and of death are implicit in what I've already developed so far about the need to wait for maturational processes in the self. Otherwise, the emphasis arising from Kenneth Lambert's informal remark is different in three ways. Firstly, it is an emphasis on becoming or being rather than on understanding, though the impediments to these may be removed through the intellectual process of analysis and through understanding. Heine Kurt himself later endorsed the idea of the transformation in O which cannot be known but only become. Secondly, if one is to take the idealist view described earlier, the recognition of the breast or the parental intercourse is in fact the recognition of an image of oneself in the medium of a fantasy which is object-related. This self is distinct from the object, which as we know may in fact be supremely unsatisfactory. Thirdly, however, thirdly, however satisfactory these objects are, they are not, with any luck, the ideals suggested by such a description as supremely good or, this, or supremely creative. With any luck, again, they will be good enough to permit such idealization at the appropriate stage of development. The fact is that objects are as good or as bad as they happen to be, and the individual self as good, as bad, or as rich and creative as, his, as its endowment allows. Confusion of the self with its object in this way seems, to borrow an earlier analogy, like confusing, confusing the subject with its predicate, confusing the innate predisposition <coughs> with its realization. The danger that this confusion permits is that an unrelinquished narcissistic self-idealization may be split off and located in the original object by a process of projective identification. This can lead to a religious idealization of the self in terms of the theoretical concepts used to describe it by various analytic schools. The self and archetypes, are, and indeed the combined object itself, have all been examples of this. The result can be a splitting off of, the part, of a part of the self rather than its ordinary realization. Now in the second part I come to the figure of Telemachus. There's no convenient terminological shorthand for this urge to bring parents together in the teeth of all the conflicting attempts to summon <coughs> Even though Sophocles' play is quite explicitly about Oedipus's identity, and psychoanalytic development subsequent to Freud have emphasized the child's need for his rival, the term Oedipus complex remains firmly associated with this rivalry and with the attacks which it engenders. 
the term primal scene does not cover the concept of the positive need to combine the parents or their pathologic representations, nor the implicit algebraic notions referred to above. I'm suggesting in the spirit of play which I enjoyed with Kenneth Lambert that Telemachus is a good candidate for the unfilled role of eponymous hero. You might remember that Telemachus is Odysseus's son in Homer's epic. There is one reading of this epic in which Telemachus can be seen as a central figure in the drama, which at first glance more obviously concerns his father. Time won't permit an exhaustive analysis of the Odyssey. You'll be glad to hear but the following observations may justify taking the matter further. The most familiar episodes of the Odyssey concerning Odysseus's trials are framed by episodes involving Telemachus. At the outset, Telemachus is prompted to try and find his father in order to save his mother and his motherland from the depredations and importunities of the suitors who may be seen as a personification of Telemachus's own attempts to possess his mother in rivalry to his father and to waste their substance. The final books concerning Odysseus's return and repossession of his wife closely concern Telemachus's support in this, as well as his own repudiation of any pretensions <coughs> of being able to string his father's bow. While the major preoccupation at the outset of the book is a threatened violation of Penelope and her marriage, the climax <laughs> comes when Odysseus establishes his identity for Penelope by making it clear that he knows the secret of the bed on which Telemachus had been conceived, following which they renew the consummation of their marriage on that bed. This is a strand in an insistent thread running through the book of contrasting types of marriage. Penelope's and, Penelope's and Odysseus's fidelity in the face of all odds, or as I shall argue despite Telemachus's attacks, is contrasted with Helen's infidelity to Menelaus, the grand scale of their sadomasochistic primal scene, represented by the Trojan War, is brought nearer home literally by Clytemnestra's violent domestic betrayal and murder of Agamemnon. The central books provide the account of Odysseus's adventures, which can be seen as successive primal scene fantasies in which Telemachus's sadism is personified by Odysseus. This starts with the blinding of the Cyclops, with his one eye, Cyclops, as many people have observed, is obviously phallic. He lives in the milk-filled cave, which surely represents breast vagina, in which Odysseus and his men have already stolen the cheeses and slaughtered the sibling sheep. The blinding of the Cyclops occasioned Poseidon's implacable wrath. Poseidon was evidently the owner of this phallus, the father representing that portion of the superego, which is going to try literally to sink Telemachus's capacity to bring his faculties together. In the next episode, Circe's sorcery represents a consequent instinctual entrapment which Odysseus narrowly escapes, and Scylla the devouring breast, which is a representation and projection of the greed. He is warned by, both by Circe and Tiresias against further greedy attacks on the breast, as symbolized by Apollo's cattle, but his men disregard that warning, so that he is faced with the threat of ultimate regression represented by, by Charybdis, whose whirlpool exposes the bottom of the sea, I think very much like Margaret Tuston's Liquid States, which I read about subsequent to writing this paper. He just hangs on to sanity and is washed up on Calypso's island, where there is no season, where, in other words, there is effectively no real time, and he is offered immortality if he marries the nymph Calypso. Through this ordeal, as through the others, he is saved from his madness and sustained with his sense of time, nine years with Calypso, by his wish to return to his wife and child. In other words, by the wish to maintain a sense of reality as represented by the combined objects. In the end, he is saved by a relatively benign superego from Poseidon's malignant split in the form of Zeus, who permits his capacities for ego-relatedness represented by Athene, to get him home. He thus no longer remains the plaything of Telemachus's malignant uh, superego, as represented by Poseidon, and is reunited, in despite of Poseidon, by his wife to complete Telemachus's primal scene. It's important that the Odyssey is not a tragedy, as is the Oresteia, which, as a sadistic primal scene fantasy, reverberates on through several phases of Italian response. This is avoided in two ways. 
in the first place because compunction, again in the form of Athene, intervenes to stop the bloodshed between the disuse and the suitors avenging relatives. In the second place, we know from Tiresias' prophecy that Odysseus will placate the otherwise implacable Poseidon when his oar, the phallic emblem of his maritime warfaring, is mistaken for a winnowing fan, the phallic emblem of domestication and fertility. In other words, Telemachus' Telemachus's superego will allow him peace when his sadism and rapacity relent and allow him a fantasy of his parents in fruitful intercourse together, the winnowing fan planted in the earth. <coughs> So this is the case for Telemachus to represent the realization of, of a creative mortal self by striving to assemble his parents' intercourse. It does not, of course, exclude divisive fantasies, and the title of the paper ought to be modified to read Oedipus and, and Telemachus rather than Oedipus or Telemachus, or perhaps Oedipus Telemachus or Telemachus Oedipus. <laughs> and now comes some clinical material. <clears throat> I hope that these ideas might become clearer in relation to the following clinical material. The patient I'm describing was referred to me as someone who had chosen second best in life and was now in a rotten marriage. The message was essentially that she needed help to get out of this marriage. What gradually emerged, however, was a picture of someone whose mother seemed too fragile, depressed and inaccessible in relation to whom to risk deintegrative processes. She had had too great a sense of separateness from her mother to be able to tolerate either an awareness of need in relation to others or of their independence from her omnipotent control. She was therefore, of course, deprived of real satisfactions in relation to them. Her inability to use them as objects was reflected in her inability to relate to the idea of her bodily orifices, resulting in earlier episodes of anorexia and in currently unsatisfying intercourse. She dealt with her sense of separateness and to a great sorry, she dealt with her sense of separateness to a great extent by identifying herself with her father's penis. This was exemplified by dream images of herself as a serpent, but especially by a dream in which she was equated via pun on her name with a dildo which an elderly couple were using to have intercourse. The process by which she appropriated the penis in fantasy had, however, the effect of damaging the mother breast from which the penis had been removed, as well as the penis itself. As a child, she had an addictive need to be reassured by a belief in her father's capacity to make everything all right, even when, it obviously, even when he obviously couldn't. He colluded in this. In latency and adolescence, she achieved an, unequi an uneasy equilibrium by means of tomboyishness and borderline delinquency, but she decompensated in her late 20s and early 30s when various relatives, including her parents, died in quick succession, thereby seeming to confirm her destructive fantasies. By the time she had had the dream I am about to report, she had changed markedly in the course of about four years of analytic treatment. The marriage was now much more satisfactory. The set-piece sadomasochistic bias had stopped. Both partners could express real need and affection, and there could be pleasure in intercourse. Modest, but real. Things were good enough for a child to have been planned and conceived, and the birth was now two months off. The dream went as follows. She's on a walk round London, where she lives with her parents, as each of them was during their final illness. With them are her husband and a figure who is both her cousin and his cousin's father, her uncle. The figure is leading the expedition and suggests they go down to the, to the river. My patient is worried that her parents are tired and might not manage. On reflection, however, she decides that the river's significance of continual renewal will refresh and to some extent renew her parents, but especially her mother. As they get to Waterloo Bridge and the view of the South Bank complex, she looks to the left. She gasps at the sight of a glistening mountain of snow and glaciers, which seem to be there instead of the river. On it, two figures are climbing. <clears throat> then the scene changes. She is still dreaming, but in the dream, struggling to get out of bed to record her dream. She is prevented by the figure of her father, who makes suggestive references to it having been good last night. 
He tries again, only to be prevented by yet another figure suggestive of incest, and on the third attempt, he encounters a flaccid phallus at the end of the bed. The crucial detail here is that of the two figures on the mountain. One is associated with the actor Richard Chamberlain, who plays the goody in a film about a race to the North Pole. He is racing against a dishonest, tricky cheat played by Rod Steiger. The patient had not seen the end of the film, nor had I, incidentally, but assumes <laughs> that Richard Chamberlain wins through by virtue of uh, by, by virtue in the end. She then remembers watching Richard Chamberlain as Dr. Kildare with her mother in a rare memory of sharing sentiment and feeling with her. There was, of course, the fact that Richard Chamberlain has the same initials and first name as myself, and of course plays a doctor. The restorative river to which she was taking her parents was explicitly related both to her pregnancy, continuity in life, and her analysis. Part of what we agreed about the dream goes as follows. Part, not all. That she wanted to restore her parents by restoring her, their relationship in her mind. This meant giving up her preemptive identification with the nipple penis so that the authentic nipple penis, represented by, in this case, the idea of her analyst, could attain, it, could attain its rightful place and role as that through which the breast can flow. The frozen breast could then flow as well as be beautiful, affording her emotional relationship and satisfaction. This would allow her to become less frozen frigid herself and to flow creatively in a way that her tomboyish puella interna identification of the penis had not. It had in the end been an unsatisfactory and placid device which failed to deliver real satisfactions at the same time as obstructing her realization of a more authentic self the self she was really like. She appeared <clears throat> to confirm this in two later dreams. In the first, a wall representing tomboyish exploits is being pulled down so that a tower can be, can be built in the parental house. She is watching television contentedly in a way which she associates with a new sense of ease in relation to her mother. In the second, she is contemplating a pleasurable intercourse with an elderly black man. She notices that she has a generously proportioned genital, in contrast to the absence of any genital in previous dreams. In other words, having allowed the authentic nipple penis its relationship with the breast, she can now match it with an appropriate orifice, previously denied the anorectic mouth with denied genitals, the blackness of the prospective lover relates to the jealousy, envy, and anxiety from which she had previously been protected by her spurious self-sufficiency, but by which she can now allow herself to be penetrated. <coughs> Substituting in the Homeric equation, if she can allow Odysseus Chamberlain, whose bow she cannot string, to beat the Steiger suitors and consummate his marriage with the Penelope Breast Mountain, she will be freed from the perpetual, timeless, but sterile use of Calypso, where there is neither real intercourse nor real satisfaction. She can then realize and contain the deintegrative potential, which is herself in relation to real objects. In other words, those of Kenneth Lambert, she will become more like herself. Thank you.